I was scrolling through Twitter and I came across this article that just literally piqued my interest just on the title alone. Now, I had no idea who this woman was until I read the title and I still didn't even know who she was. But something that was in the title stuck out to me like a sore thumb and it'll stick out to you as well. But this woman's name is Lisa Monaco and she is the Justice Department nominee uh, by uh, Joe Biden for deputy attorney general. Now, apparently she also worked under the Obama administration, I think in the counterterrorism department. And now she's a nominee for this position, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about what she, uh, one particular thing that she did that literally makes her the palm colored version of clown Mala Harris in the female version of Mr. Touchy Feely 46. So according to the title, it says that this woman prosecuted a black man and he was sentenced to 27 years in prison for selling $20 worth of drugs. Remember what we always say, whenever it is a black man in particular, when it comes to drug distribution or drug sales, and mind you, this is $20 worth of drugs. So that's like literally a year for a year per dollar that he did plus an additional seven years. According to this, she was the one responsible for that. And I said, that's why I said she's basically the PC version of clown Mala and the female version of Joe Biden and Joe Biden just now recently has nominated her for deputy attorney general. Look at who they're putting in these positions. That's why you have to vet these people. You have to really do your research, but you know, all black people wanted to do was get 45 out of office and put someone else in there to rock them back to sleep. And that's exactly what's going to end up happening. I'm seeing it now. Like I said, my mantra for the next four years is this is who you voted for. Let's get into it. For um, Mr. Touchy Philly nominee to serve as deputy attorney general, help prosecute a black man who was sentenced to 27 years in prison for selling $20 worth of heroin to an undercover police officer officer now we know that their rules when it comes to the heroin and opioids and everything like that they said they always prosecute the distributor but i've never known them to to give them that huge of a sentence that lengthy of a sentence 27 years for 20 dollars worth i need to see her other prosecutory records like anybody else is like any other um, ethnic group. I need to see that. The government jar- um, dropped charges against the man co-defended as a part of the plea deal, court records show. Lisa Monaco, who Biden tapped for the Justice Department position, was one of the assistant U.S. attorneys who prosecuted a case in 2003 against Reginald C. Stewart, a Washington, D.C. man who was charged following an undercover drug bust. Now, listen to that. That was back in 2003. That man is still in jail today because 20 years would be 2023. He hasn't reached 20 years yet. Stewart was arrested in Washington, D.C. on August 20th, 2002 and was charged with unlawful distribution of heroin, according to court records. Now, mind you, this was before the heroin plague blew out of control. He was convicted at a jury trial on April 16, 2003, and was sentenced to 27 years in prison. An appeals court in 2007 upheld Stewart's conviction, but noted that the evidence presented against him at trial wasn't overwhelming, meaning it wasn't convincing enough, but they still prosecuted and sentenced him to 27 years anyway. But Stewart's co-defendant, who physically conducted the drug exchange with the undercover police officer, had his charges dropped after he pleaded guilty to drug possession in another case. Court records show the man, Bobby Prelo, show that he received a 12 month jail sentence. Now look at that, look at that. So the one who got 27 years in prison wasn't even directly responsible for being the one who was distributing the drugs. The one who did do it got a plea deal, got one year in jail, but the one who didn't actually do the actual sell got 27 years. This reminds me of the story that I talked about uh, about that black man named Dustin Higgs, who got the lethal injection right before 45 was out of prison, who got 
the death penalty for being indirectly involved with something, meaning he did not commit the actual crime itself, but he was there because of association. But the person who actually did commit the crime in the murder got like a life sentence without parole, which means they're still in jail now and they don't have the death penalty to their name. But the one who didn't actually do it got the injection. See how this works? This kind of reminds me of the same thing. Monaco, who's Monaco, whose most recent government position was as Homeland Homeland Security Advisor to then uh, President Barack Obama, disclosed her work on Stewart's case in her written responses to questions from the Senate Judiciary Committee as part of her confirmation process to the Justice Department position. Defendant was convicted of unlawful distribution of heroin after a jury trial, Monaco wrote in her disclosure. The government utilized expert testimony regarding the practice of drug distribution operations and eyewitness testimony, she wrote. The defendant was sentenced to 27 years of incarceration with all but 180 months sentence suspended. Monaco did not give more detail about what role she played on the case. She forwarded a request for comment to the Department of Justice. A spokesman for the agency was unable to provide information about the case prior to the publication of this article and did not offer comment. The White House also did not respond to a request for comment. Monaco's work on the case had not been previously reported, though she also disclosed it to the Senate Intelligence Committee in 2011, when she was nominated to serve as an assistant attorney general for national security in the Obama administration. Monaco was not asked about her involvement in the Stewart case during that confirmation hearing and has not received media coverage. That's because they were burying it and they had to have known. They had to have known what it was, but they decided not to talk about it. And like I said, this right here, what I just read is all happening under the Obama administration under his second. No. Going into a second term. A day has not been set for a hearing for Monaco's confirmation for the deputy assistant general position. Biden announced Monaco's nomination on January 7th, calling her a top flight prosecutor who took on public corruption, corporate fraud and violent crime. Listen to those words. Top flight prosecutor. That sounds a lot like when Clown Mala called herself the top cop. And we know who she prosecuted the vast majority of. Monaco touted her work as an assistant federal prosecutor in her acceptance speech. I worked directly with communities and victims of crime, and I felt the weight of a prosecutor's responsibility to ensure that not not that cases are won, but that justice is done and that each individual defendant's rights are protected. Monaco made a name for herself in the Justice Department as a member of the Enron Task Force, which prosecuted executives from the energy giant and one of the biggest accounting frauds in U.S. history. I remember that I was that was back in 2000, I believe. So I was around, I was 11 or turning 11 that year when that happened. I think that's how, in case for y'all that don't remember, that's how Martha Stewart got caught, up, got caught up. As much as Monaco and the Justice Department have touted the prison sentences hand down in the landmark case, none were as harsh as the one given to Stewart. Monaco was a co-lead prosecutor in cases against Ken Rice, Enron's chief operating officer, and Kevin Hannon, the company's co-CEO. She said in her Senate responses that she helped negotiate plea deals that led to prison sentences of 27 months and 24 months for Rice and Hannon, respectively. That was all I was asking for. What was her prosecutorial record with other groups of people and for what cases? Meanwhile, no shock here, two palm colored men committed one of the biggest, one of the biggest I guess you could say crimes financially wise in history. And they only got two and a half in two years in prison. Meanwhile, $20 worth of drugs. And this guy gets 27 years and he hasn't even reached year 20 yet. And they said that that was one of the most harshest sentences she's ever given while being a prosecutor. Are you surprised? Cause I'm not. Monaco also worked on the case against Enron CEO Jeffrey Skilling, who was sentenced to 24 years in prison for his role in the accounting fraud. According to her Senate disclosure, Skilling served just over 12 years of his sentence, which means he only did half the time. While Biden would have no involvement in the Stewart case, he has been dogged by allegations that anti-crime and anti-drug bills he sponsored during his Senate career had led to excessive prison sentences for nonviolent offenders a.k.a. the 1994 crime bill. 
Biden came under scrutiny during the Democratic primaries for his sponsorship of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which created sentencing disparities for the sale of cocaine versus crack. Meanwhile, his uh, son, Hunter Biden, that narchead, he should have under his own law should have been one of the ones uh, sentenced under that. But we're not going to dive into that. Criminal justice reform advocates have asserted that stiffer penalties for crack dealing led to disproportionately longer prison sentences for poor people and minorities. Why don't they just say black people? Um, because of the higher prevalence of crack in their communities. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, which Biden also co-sponsored, strengthened the prison sentence for drug possession, according to Vox. Stewart may have had previous drug felonies, which could explain why prosecutors sought a harsh sentence against him in 2003. Records from the D.C. Superior Court list a Reginald Stewart as being sentenced to two years in jail for attempted robbery in 1984. A man by the same name was sentenced to 20 months in prison in 1987 for distributing cocaine. A man named Reginald Stewart, who pleaded guilty in 1990 to distributing heroin, was sentenced to three years in jail, according to Superior Court records. Legal filings for Stewart's 2003 case were not immediately available, so it is not clear whether any previous felonies factored into the 27-year sentence. The D.C. Superior Court told the Daily Caller News Foundation that records for a case as old as Stewart's would take weeks to process. Stewart served just over 13 years of his prison sentence. Records from the Bureau of Prisons show that he was discharged on October 31st, 2016. Oh, so he did get out. So he is out. OK, I'm thinking he's still there. And they said he was 54 years of age. He applied for early release from prison in 2013 for good behavior, but was denied, according to records from the Washington, D.C. Superior Court. Details of Stewart's 2003 case are laid out in the appeal he filed in the Washington, D.C. Court of Appeals in 07, seeking to overturn his conviction to have a new trial in Washington Superior Court. Even though he did, even though he did get out early, still, 27 years is a long time that he could have had. Monica, Monaco said in her disclosure that she split the time between cases in the U.S. federal court in Washington and on violent and drug crimes filed in the city superior court. Perhaps the most glaring disparity in Stewart's case is the difference in punishment for Stewart and Prelo, his co-defendant. Stewart and Prelo were arrested after Prelo sold the $20 in heroin to Clarence Brooks, an undercover Washington, D.C. police officer, according to the appeals court's opinion. During the sting, Brooks asked Prelo for two dime bags of heroin worth $20. Prelo took the money and walked up to a group of people, one of whom Brooks identified as Stewart. Brooks, who testified he was 15 to 20 feet away from the transaction, said he heard Prelo say two before a man later identified as Stewart bent over to pick up two Ziploc bags laying on the ground. Brooks said the bags contained a white powder. Stewart and Prelo were arrested after another police officer who was monitoring the sting operation followed and arrested them, according to the appeals court document. Brooks identified Stewart and Prelo as the same two men involved in the drug deal officers found $14 in cash in Stewart's pockets, the appellate court documents says, but no drugs. The trial court relied almost solely on Brooks testimony to link Stewart to the drug deal. The appellate court did not raise issue with any of Brooks testimony, but the filing noted that other witnesses, including Prelo, claimed to have evidence that Stewart may have not taken part in the drug exchange. Three women, including Stewart's mother, testified at this trial that they were speaking with Stewart at the time of the drug deal and did not see him walk to a fence where police said the transaction occurred, according to the appellate court. Stewart filed an appeal in April, 2000, April 21st, 2004, asserting that his attorney failed to speak with Prelo, his co-defendant, who offered to provide exculpatory evidence. The appellate filing said Prelo signed an affidavit that he never received drugs or money from Stewart and that the, he conducted the drug deal with Brooks, the undercover cop. Stewart filed one appeal seeking a reversal of his conviction due to lack of evidence. Another appeal sought a new trial on the basis that Stewart received ineffective legal advice. The appellate court did not grant Stewart's request to overturn his conviction, but the panel did find merit in his argument that the trial court erred in denying his motion for a hearing for his claim that he received inadequate legal counsel. The appellate court also disputed the trial court's assertion that the evidence against Stewart was overwhelming. Nor in our judgment was the evidence against appellate actually overwhelming, the appellate court ruling says. The court noted that the jury at Stewart's trial submitted a question during deliberations about whether someone else might have been dressed in clothing similar to an appellate and whether police had kept a steady eye on appellant before his arrest. Basically, what it sounded like to me is like they just sounded so unsure, but they still went with the testimony of the cop anyway. 
Stewart could not be reached for comment. His attorney during his trial, Walter S. Boost, died in 2012. Con uh, and that's pretty much it. So we got a backstory on her with this case. And then we got a whole full blown backstory on the case as in, in, as in its entirety. I, I did not remember this case. And I was about 13 when this, uh you know, when all of this happened. And it's crazy because a couple months later, the D.C. snipers happened. And we all remember that one, especially if you lived in this area at that time. But yeah, this is who, this is who Mr. Touchy Philly 46 is giving positions to this. But you know what? This is who y'all voted for. He called her a top flight prosecutor. That sounds a lot like Kamala Harris's top cop comment. So he basically got the white adjacent version of her in this position and her track record with this one case right here proves that. But hey, this is who y'all voted for. Y'all let me know what y'all think about this down in the comments. Like, share, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please text the number that is pinned down in the comments below so you can receive notifications every time I upload a new video.